messages can come and reach us. Thank you, Leslie. John chapter 2. Thank you. The reading is from John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This is the first of his miraculous signs. Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. <coughs> Lord of renewal, and of all that's good, and of the very highest quality, be with us as we seek to hear something old but important, perhaps, maybe something new, from a story that we know so well. And we ask that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus turning water into wine. Old hat, right? Well, yes it is really, in some ways. So I brought something from the extensive Rudel wine cellars, of course, I had to go down underneath that house, <laughs> stick it down, and scrape the mushrooms off it. Has anyone ever been out to dinner, and while sitting at the table, been amused, while wine buffs pick up bottles like this, and they start talking in a foreign language. <laughs> Never seen it. I realise that some here might know lots about this. They're probably very hurt about me re referring to it. And you probably know all about the five S's of appreciating fine wines. <laughs> See, swirl, sniff, sip, and savour. And having done all that, the wine buffs all start talking pretentiously about vineyards and vintages and bouquets and overtones, and it's just so boring. <laughs> <laughs> they sound much like I do when I start talking about steam engines, actually. <laughs> but the Bible tells us in John's Gospel of something that Jesus did at the very outset of his ministry. He turned water into wine. And he certainly pleased at least one wine buff, about whom we read, the master of the banquet, tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you save the best till now. Now only John's Gospel gives us this story, and it's the very first of just seven signs we might want to call them miracles that John gives us. The other gospel writers litter their accounts with amazing things that Jesus did. For John, just seven. He's very picky, and he very carefully constructs his account of the ministry of Jesus round these seven signs. Changing water into wine in Cana, healing the son of someone important in Capernaum, that's in John 4, healing someone who was paralyzed at Bethesda, John 5, feeding the 5,000, to John 6. He shows us Jesus walking on water, that's also in John 6. And we see he, him actually healing a man who was blind from birth, that's in John 9. Then we have Lazarus raised from dead, a little further on in John 11. 
And then, of course, we have the resurrection of Jesus himself. That's number seven. Now, John may have had some purpose in constructing his gospel like that, which 2,000 years down the road, we simply have lost sight of. We don't know why perhaps he did it like that. But I reckon a really helpful way to see these signs of his is to note that he represents the Lord Jesus as having the power to see things as God, his Father, and Creator sees things. And so in some very specific situations, we see him, as it were, putting things right, putting things back to where they should be, as our loving Heavenly Father intended. And three of the signs, or miracles, have to do with humans living together in society and the environment in which they live. The other four, though, are particularly focused on individual people. And that indicates to me that John, our Gospel writer, wants to highlight that our God loves all of his creation, the world in general, his creation, people, society at large, and we individuals who live in it. He knows us. He knows you, and he knows me. He probably disapproves of me, I should think, but he knows us all. Jesus is truly Lord of all, just as we are. He takes us as we are. So we see Jesus correcting a social problem at Cana. Our Heavenly Father wants to see his people full of joy. Water into wine. And in a sense, we're seeing God at work in that. It's something that is ordinary, to do with ordinary people. They're all at a wedding. And John shows us Jesus doing something similar when he feeds a huge number of people by the shores of Galilee. Our Heavenly Father has no desire that those who live in this world of his should go hungry, because there is enough to go around if we distribute it properly. In this sign, that great outdoor picnic of the feeding, we see humanity coming alongside the purposes of God, and we see human sharing, the grace of God worked out in its highest form. And then out on the lake, we meet Jesus walking on water. And the point being made here is that if we have a creator God, surely he's at one with the enormous powers of nature because he was somehow instrumental in bringing them into being. And then we're traveling with him and we watch as he heals a sick boy and then someone paralyzed and then that man born blind from birth or who is blind from birth. And finally, we're with Jesus in Bethany as he weeps in sadness because his friend Lazarus has died, and he raises him to life. So our God set the processes in motion that gave us the bodies in which we live. But the Bible makes it quite clear that we live in a fallen world where those bodies are subject to attack, serious attack, and can be frail, and can go wrong because of the common chemical and cellular problems that we all know about. But that's not in the will of God for the people he loves, for all living things, and we're still with Lazarus here, for all living things, death is part of the deal, isn't it? And yes, we know only too well that death, which is somehow out of time, is a tragedy, and our God knows that. And this resurrection story about Lazarus oddly doesn't focus on Lazarus himself at all. We know absolutely nothing about it, because I've never struck you. The account of the raising of Lazarus focuses entirely on Jesus and is given to us to prepare us for Jesus' own death and his own resurrection. So that last but one of John's seven signs is to point the way to a way our God in Christ is about to provide a structure, a way to put right that which is wrong in the world to help us to look our Creator in the eye. And when we've read and taken in the six earlier signs that John has highlighted for us, we shouldn't be surprised that when Jesus himself is put to death, unjustly, up against the powers of evil in this world, he rises again and he overcomes those forces of evil. And that's at the center of our gospel. So John's Gospel sparkles with insights, and there are things he points to that may have significance that would have 
instantly been understood by people living in the ancient world who first read it. And actually, if you've ever wondered why people study theology, it's because of exactly that business of trying to drill down to what was being written for us by men like John 2,000 years ago in an utterly different cultural setting from the way things are for us here today. Actually, what we believe and what we could say about God has to be reconsidered and re-expressed for every generation and in every cultural setting. That's why theology always has to be relevant. We can't live looking back at the way people used to see things. But let's get back to Kina and the party, shall we? I started my ministerial life as a Baptist minister, and my second church was in North London. It was quite a big church, and one of the old members was a strict teetotaler, having grown up in the temperance movement where you had to sign a pledge that you'd never drink. His daughter had been a temperance queen in her childhood, and she'd also signed a pledge. She was a lovely woman, and her pledge signing never stopped her from making the most fabulous and powerful sherry trifles that I've ever enjoyed. <laughs> but anyway, her old dad asked me outright at a public church meeting if I ever took any alcohol. Actually, it was the public church meeting where they were due to appoint me. And I had to admit that very occasionally I did take a little alcohol, but it wasn't a big personal issue for me. I didn't drink very much. He was appalled, though. And as for him, it was, it was impossible to be a proper Christian if alcohol ever passed your lips. Thereafter, he called me a drinker. And when I rose to preach, he would be sitting at the front of the church and he would fussily remove his, he sort of unscrew his hearing aid and let it dangle over his shoulder on the wire. Um, or he would get up and very purposefully walk out through one of the side doors, which were on either side of the pulpit. And, uh, well, it was Christian grace at its best, wasn't it, really? <laughs> but that dear old chap certainly knew about Jesus turning water into wine. And indeed, I asked him about it, and he snapped back, well, of course Jesus had turned water into wine, but it was non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> <laughs> there was a question I wanted to ask about communion, too, but there are some battles that just aren't worth fighting. So I let it rest, I made an effort to shake his hand, and I walked away. But actually, I and my brothers were brought up in a strictly teetotal household. So I had some insights, and it was easy to put him into context. And I had to do that, otherwise his behavior would have been distressing. And he'd grown up in a pretty poor London environment, East London environment, where alcohol had been a huge social problem. In the first 20, years of the 20th century, there were still many people living in poverty and routinely getting drunk when he was a kid. They spent the household money, they lay in gutters, they beat their wives, that sort of thing. And he knew all about that. That had coloured his whole view. And I respected that. And we forget that Britain's cities only had good, pure, pumped drinking water from the 1850s onwards. So if you were a man doing heavy labouring and you wanted a long drink, you needed lots of locally brewed beers and things like that that were free from cholera and the other bugs that would kill you quick as anything. And London in the 17th and 18th centuries didn't have very good water at all. It had terrible water, actually. And the poorest people used to drink, what was it? Gin. Um, from a number of big London distilleries. And it was a horrific scourge. So that's why that movement, teetotalism, grew up, absolutely rightly, to fight a human scourge. And my old friend in the church, who did eventually come round and start to be civil, I actually buried him, but he was dead at the time, I assure you. He <laughs> <laughs> been born only about 40 years after reliably clean water was available in his part of North London. So he was a bit of a cultural leftover, and had probably been influenced, I think, by his parents and what he'd seen as a kid. And as I said, I had to respect that. But having said that, sitting in the old-fashioned compartment of a heritage train a year or two back with my brother, we got talking to three young women sitting opposite us who were all paramedics. And I asked them what they felt was the biggest social evil in our present-day modern world from their perspective on the ambulances. And they didn't even bother to look at each other, they just said with one voice, alcohol. And of course it is. 
They said alcohol should be treated as a class one drug for some people because its abuse is a massively destructive evil, but often a hidden one. It makes its presence known in the physical and the psychological damage to vulnerable partners and children all around us. It can turn people into monsters and others into highly vulnerable victims, as we know only too well. But I digress. I said I was going to take us back to the party, but so I will. Once again, back to Cana in Galilee. Our gospel reading tells us that Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, went to a wedding. Lots of unknowns about that. Cana was possibly somewhere to the west of the Lake of Galilee. And in the past, it's been suggested that it might actually have been the wedding of one of Mary's relatives. We don't know. It doesn't matter, actually. It was a wedding, and everybody was invited to those Middle Eastern weddings. They were community affairs. And they went on a long time. Life was hard. So when they celebrated anything, they really went for it. And as the master of the feast says to the bridegroom, most people bring out the really good wine at the beginning of the feast. And when the people have drunk a lot and are less discerning, they bring out the rougher stuff. But you kept the best till last. And that, of course, says it all about the will of God for his people. He wants the very best. I believe, for all of us. The church doesn't always serve that up, does it? And even when we're at our least sensible and discerning, the Lord God still wants the best for those he loves. And that's all of us, whatever our background, whatever our situation, whoever and whatever we are. Ours is the Lord who includes all, and he wants the best for us. That's central to what we stand for here. The people of the Lord Jesus were never to be exclusive. And if you ever come across Christians who are, who want to exclude people on grounds of race perhaps, or of sexuality, or of social standing, or class criminal record, or simply believing something different from them, anything at all, then walk away and pray for them. For Christ Jesus is the Lord who includes all, mm. and he wants the best for us all. And we are all equally his creation. We have to grasp that, you know, and hang on to it through thick and thin, and I think we sometimes forget it. Sometimes things can indeed be pretty thin, too, as illnesses take hold of us, and disappointments flood over us of one kind or another. Let's go back to the party. There we go. A suitable sort of, um, looks a bit like a Roman pot, doesn't it? So what Jesus did was something rather better than this, of course. There we go. You expected that, didn't you? <laughs> You'd have been disappointed if it didn't happen. <laughs> looks quite a good vintage. Swirl. <laughs> Essence of skunk, I think. <laughs> I want to highlight actually, that in doing this, my own father would be dismayed to see this. He would be horrified. To deliver part of a sermon with a wine glass in hand, he would have been spinning, probably is, spinning in his grave. And I want to highlight that the promise that shouts in this opening part of John's Gospel, in this first sign, is much bigger than wine. It's not primarily about the setting, either. The wedding party at Canaan in Galilee. I'm intrigued by the fact that one of John's signs has to do with water becoming wine, and another highlights the breaking of bread and its distribution to a huge crowd. Mm. And we can be sure that's deliberate because John would surely want to remind his readers that the only direct command that the Lord Jesus ever gave to his followers was to break bread and drink wine, to celebrate together what had happened what was about to happen, actually, in the breaking of his body on the cross. His spilt blood was for us. But so was the resurrection. So was the resurrection. And taken together, the remarkable <laughs> effects of the passion and then of, the, of what happened at Easter, we see something that I talked about a little earlier. We see God putting things right, putting things right between his awfully failed humanity and what he wants for them. 
his very best. So, not primarily about wine, not primarily about the wedding, but this miracle that we read about at Cana is about people having a lovely time celebrating. This story is about the fact that our God surprises his people and keeps his best for us until his own good time. And it isn't a story, it's an account. At which point we may become aware that he's very much with us in turning us from glass half empty people, as we so often are, to glass half full people, or even glass completely full people. He wants us to be his buoyant, joyful, hopeful people. I have no idea what that might mean in my life, or in yours. Some of you were aware that I hit 70 last Sunday. Good reason for keeping away from church. We weren't doing other things. But 70 last Sunday, and I was explaining, I got out of Sunday, I got out of bed on the Monday. I didn't dribble or anything. It was okay. <laughs> but our lives in the Lord Jesus have a focus beyond today, and indeed beyond the point where we stop, where we step off what Shakespeare called this mortal coil. And that's a huge element of Christian faith. Looking for what of the best the Lord wants to bring in our lives. Looking for the Lord of life and love who can satisfy us now, but also brings out the best in his own good time. Now, I'm sorry I haven't got enough glasses for you, <laughs> but I will propose a toast to you on your behalf and say, thank you, Lord, for all that you give us. Thank you. We know that you want the very best for us. Amen. Amen.